الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته لا يوم الدين. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. <coughs> and this is the um, Q and A uh, section. Of the evening, inshallah, we'll take some questions from brothers, and also we'll take questions from sisters, which is which are being sent by text messages, and um, so everybody will get a chance to get their questions heard, and hopefully, inshallah, answered. But before moving on to the questions. <coughs> I just like to stress uh, the importance of we ourselves as existing fathers uh, and mothers here ensuring that we know Islam and know Islam properly and practice it. Because in the end, the success of our children Islamically will largely depend on how much we are ourselves conscious of what Islam is and really and truly live the tenets of Islam. Because though we may appear as practicing Muslims, mean that we do Muslim practices. If our hearts are attached to this dunya to such a level that we have allowed our children to go astray on the scale that they have done, then this is saying something about our practicing Islam. That we, yes, maybe are more conscious or are more conscientious in doing the rituals. And on the basis of that, we are called practicing Muslims. But is practicing Islam just practicing the rituals? Will rituals get us to paradise? Reality, of course, is that without the heart, without the heart being committed to Islam, then no amount of ritual will carry us to paradise. Because the heart is what will determine everything. As the Prophet Sallallahu had said, Inna fil jasadi mudra. There is in the body a clump of flesh. Ida saluha, saluha dil jasadu kullu. If it is right, if it becomes good, then the whole body becomes good. And if it is dead, if it is attached to the dunya, then the whole body is dead, diseased, and attached to the dunya. So though we go through the ritual, those rituals have no impact. And our children will see through those rituals very quickly and very easily. They will abide by them when they're young enough when we can force them, threaten them, browbeat them, <coughs> you know. They are afraid, so they'll do it. But as soon as they realize that all I have to do is call 911, then you can't do it anymore. You can't do it anymore. So if we don't win their hearts for Islam, they will not be Muslims. 
And if our hearts are not one for Islam, if we haven't submitted our hearts to Islam, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then as they say, Faqadu shay la yu'ti. One who has nothing cannot give anything. So I would advise those of you that have the opportunity or are able to find the opportunity to learn about the religion properly, to learn about parenting. If we are not, if we recognize that we're not effective parents, that we don't really know what we're doing, we don't know how to win our children over, how to guide them. We're just bumbling and fumbling and damaging our children on the way. Get help. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So the law tells us. Go and ask those who have knowledge if we don't have it. We shouldn't be ashamed to recognize our weaknesses and get help. Of course, first and foremost, we should try to get help from other Muslims. Muslims who are knowledgeable in those fields. But if we can't find any Muslims, even to go to non-Muslims, at least get some doesn't mean that because they're not Muslims they don't have any knowledge which can benefit us, of course not. But we have to turn this situation around. Otherwise, we're doomed. And we represent here what is happening in the rest of the Muslim world. The problem is not really just confined here to us here and now. We are carrying with us the same problems which exist back home. It may not be as obvious because the concentration of Muslims is greater. But the same, same thing is happening there too. Back home, it's happening in our own Muslim countries. So, among the opportunities that we may have for those who want to know more about Islam, we have a university set up called the Islamic Online University, which provides knowledge about Islam, even in areas of child psychology, education, it's all brought together under the general banner of Islam. We hope that those of you that want to enlighten yourself because you don't have the opportunity to learn Islam in a structured program so you can learn it properly and pass it on as opposed to attending a class, a circle, sitting with one person or another occasionally Friday you hear things but in the end what can you do with it you're not learning in a structured environment everything else that is important to us we learn it in a structured fa fashion we'll go to a school we sit under some experts, whatever. We learn in a structured way. This is how we really learn. If we're not in structured programs, then we are exposed to information, but we can't really utilize that information. So the Islamic Online University, which has a diploma program, where currently more than 100,000 students around the world are studying, free, absolutely free. Courses are available, access it. There is also a BA in Islamic Studies, which is virtually free, it is for less than nothing. And uh, it is accredited, a means to study for those of you who want to 
gain better knowledge to benefit your families, this is an opportunity for you. Allah has made it possible and I hope inshallah that you would take the benefit from it. There's a few pamphlets here for those people who are interested after the lecture you can come up and get them. Okay. You had a question? Bismillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. First of all, jazakallah khair for the beautiful topic that you brought up. You made all of us very scared. Inshallah, uh, I just wanted to know what are the mechanics to avoid uh, uh, at that specific age you were mentioning uh, on between 15 and, and uh, or between 13 for, for girls, whatever age is it, that, that, that decade, to um, um, kind of uh, be um, in front of that event before it can, it can happen. What are the mechanics, what are the see has been given to us so we can prepare for that uh, Hmm. For, that, for that age. Okay, brothers, a question or request for some advice for how to prepare for that decade of rebellion where we have lost and are losing and continue to lose so many of our young people. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the starting point is our schools. You know, if we have a Muslim school here and we can't even fill it, there are vacancies in the school, even uh, below the, the uh, junior high, there are vacancies in the school. And we're not filling it. But even more importantly, as I mentioned, we need to have the high school and junior high functioning. We need to bring it back alive again. People spent money and time and effort to set it up, build it, and it fell. It fell due to a variety of different reasons. But simply because it fell, it doesn't mean we cannot revive it. You know, there are new administration, there's new efforts, new blood is coming to the community, whatever. We can bring it back to life again. That will go a long way at least for those who are able to get into the program, it will go a long way to saving those. But, of course, not everybody would be able to get in. And what do they do? Well, they also have to consider that that period of junior high school and high school is so critical that we have to look at the alternative in front of us, which is homeschooling. It may seem to be something very formidable, but how are we going to do this? But reality is that there are thousands and thousands of families across Canada doing it. BC has one of the best homeschooling provided by the government, homeschooling programs with tutors and everything to help you Teach your kids right at home. Save them from that circumstance. But Muslims don't even know it. You know, we don't even consider it. We're used to just dumping the kids in the school and say, you know, inshallah. But we have to take an active part in educating our children and raising them. We have become inactive. We have to be actively engaged. And of course, we need to have this program running right from kindergarten all the way up. To try to catch them even in that last decade, if they're messed up in the six years before it, it's not that easy. But still, you have a chance. So better that than nothing. But technically speaking, what we need to do is all the way. Because that is the right of every Muslim child. That he or she be educated by believing Muslims. That's their right. When we put our children in the hands of non-Muslims, 
we have sinned. It is a sin. Those critical years when their minds, their personalities are being formed, and we put them in the hands of non-Muslims who are secular in their outlook. And education is culture being conveyed. It's culture. There is information, but it's mixed in. It comes in a cultural package. And that culture is a secular culture. A godless culture. That's what secular means. It sounds nice when you say secular, but in real terms, it's godless. A godless culture. <coughs> so these are among the things that we have to do. Among them is, as I mentioned, this is sort of a repeat, we have to have functioning masjids. Masjids which serve the needs of the community. If our biggest need is the loss of our youth in that decade, how can we get them back to the masjid? Because one of the seven who are shaded by the throne is what? Rajulun qalbuhu mu'allaqun bil masajid. The man, woman, whose heart is attached to the masjid. So how do we get that heart attached? We have to find ways and means of bringing them back to the masjid. That they will be attracted to the masjid. Now if you go to them and say, come, come to the masjid, there is a talk. They say, talk about what? What, is it? what am I going to hear? Same old, same old. That's what I heard before when I was growing up. I'm a, I don't need to listen to that stuff anymore. You know. But if you said, come down to the center and play some basketball or some football, they're coming to church. That's fun. So if that is what brings them, then we have to make that available. Use that channel by which to reach out to them and to educate them, to try to save them. They're doing that in other parts of Canada. In Toronto, alhamdulillah, the masjid I was in, Abu Huraira, they develop what they call the MBA, the Muslim Basketball Association. And they made up teams from all across the GTA, across the Toronto, and they played and they have championship and they've branched out. They have a branch now in, um, in Ottawa. And they're going out to Montreal. And you can do it here too. And the boys will travel, they meet. And they're doing this within an Islamic framework. There are those who survived that period, who know what the problems are who are their coaches, who are training them, etc. But when the time for Salah comes, the game stops, everybody prays. For them to go to play in the championships, the, stu the, 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 the players who are chosen are those who regularly attended classes because all the students are supposed to attend some classes on the deen. So there is that combination of sport and deen. I mean, if we're going to attract them, we have to offer them something which is attractive, which appeals to them. We have to find other methods. And that's why I said we don't need to build more mosques in the way that our mosques are today where we spend a lot of money to make that beautiful dome. That beautiful dome, the cost for all of that, we could have made a center for the youth. You know? And that beautiful dome is not sunnah. Look at that. Even the big minaret. It's not sunnah. It's no harm. We're not saying bid'ah. I'm not saying haram. But... You know, we have to look at how we spend our monies. Because we will be asked about our wealth and how we spent it. 
So we have to be wise. We have to look at the realities and find solutions and use our money in a way which is going to benefit our community. Take a question from the sisters. A lot of people say that uh, the Islamic schools, their standards, their academic standards and the academic quality is not as high as public schools. So people who want to go to higher universities, better universities, then they pull the kids out because for that reason. So what is the answer to that? Okay, brothers, um, question from the sisters, quoted by the brother. Uh, about the standards of the Muslim schools, that a number of them, their standards are low. The public schools are better, higher standards, and if the children are to be able to continue their education, higher education, you know, they need to be properly prepared. So if in these schools are not uh, functioning properly academically, then the children will be at a loss. Young people will be at a loss. First and foremost, let me say that our Muslim schools should be the best. They should be the best. Our children deserve the best. We shouldn't cut corners. We shouldn't, you know, be neglectful. Well, it's a Muslim school, you know, we can let this go, it's not that important, we don't have to do this, we don't, no, no. We have to do everything that we can to give them the best education possible. Imagine if when they do the government assessment of the schools, the Muslim schools, the four or five schools here, were number one, two, three, four, five. What do you think would happen? What do you think would happen? It's put in the newspaper. The top five schools in Vancouver are the five Muslim schools. People would say, wow, what are they doing there? You know, that would be da'wah in and of itself. People will be coming down to see, oh, what's going on in this place? That just by itself would be major dawah. <coughs> but besides that, our children deserve to have that. As the Prophet Sallallahu had said, Inna Allah yuhibbu min ahadikum mida amala amalan an yutqina. Allah loves from each and every one of you, if you do anything, you do it to the best of your ability. <coughs> That's what we should have, the best here for Muslims. So it is shameful, really, shameful that our schools have such a low standard that people, this would be an issue. It is shameful. Part of it goes back to people's view of the school. You know, if we look at the school as a business, if we look at the school as a business, then, you know, when you're running your business, you want to cut down on your overhead, right? Right? Cut down on your overhead. So, overhead is qualified, well-qualified teachers and, you know, the other things. So, you cut corners, you know. You don't need that lab. Or you don't need all that equipment or... Well, when the time for inspection comes, okay, we get new equipment. But the rest of the time, the equipment is broken, it's just left, you know? Because we're only thinking in terms of business. But bottom line is that the Islamic school is business for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that business for Allah will only be accepted by Allah if it is done properly. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu had said you have to slaughter a goat. Don't slaughter the one that's blind in one eye and his horn is broken and you know, he's cheaper, but you know, you're slaughtering it for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Giving thanks to Allah, you slaughter the good animal. Same way with our school, we sacrifice, we give the best for the sake of Allah. So we need to do that. But 
At the same time that I say that, <coughs> on the other hand, just keep in mind that if we, our kids go to the Islamic school, which is inferior, but they come through with their Islam intact, they're better off than the child who we put in the public school system whose Islam is destroyed, but his academics are excellent. We have to know what our priorities are. Not as a justification for inferior education. No, we said that should not be. We should be giving them the best. But even if we don't have the best, we have to understand that the best for our children is to be on the path to paradise. It's best for them to know Allah, believe in Him, and live Islam. That is what's best for them. But when we say, I'm thinking of the best for my kids, that's why I'm pulling them out of the Islamic school and I'm going to put them in the public school, we have to question, what do you mean by the best? What really is the best? Have you really understood what is best? So, we have to work on both ends. And I'm not, as I said, saying that we should be tolerant of inferior education for our children. No, we should insist. As parents, we should put pressure on the administration to ensure that our kids are getting the best that we can possibly give them. We should. We, as parents, have that duty, we have that responsibility. But oftentimes, we don't take that parental responsibility properly. We see what's going on, we don't like it, we complain, we backbite and we carry on in the back, you know. But nothing gets changed. No, we have to act as a community and correct this, inshallah. We, uh, we agree, okay, for the time being, we accept the shortcomings of the academic uh, issues for while taking our kids to the Islamic school. But on the other hand, we see that the kids are not getting Islamic education either. You have non-Muslim non teachers, so much so that in one case, a volunteer Christian missionary was hired to teach. You bring out the issue, the te teachers are trying to very subtly show up the non-Islamic non non themes to the kids, like during the time of Valentine's, time of Halloween. And this, are, this is what the non-Muslim teachers are giving in Islamic school. When you come up and bring these issues to the principals and the administrators, they just uh, don't pay attention to your complaints. So well, you know, the thing is that what our brother is raising is another problem which exists within the Muslim schools where some Muslim schools are lax about uh, what teachers may be doing, non-Muslim teachers who are in the school. They may be involved in Valentine's and Halloween and other things which we know are un-Islamic and not permissible. <coughs> But, uh, uh, but parents, when they complain, they're not getting any kind of you know, redress from the administration. This is a problem. Of course, it is problematic. But the problem is that when individual parents try to do this, this is what's going to happen. Unless parents get together, you know, then they represent a voice that has to be heard. That if you don't correct this, you know, we'll pull all of our kids out at one time, you know. Where, where there's pressure put on that these, the, the administrations comply. It should be. As the brother was mentioning, even in one school, you know, a, um, a, a missionary, voluntarily, volunteer missionary was hired, was brought on. He came on voluntarily and was teaching in the school. Well, this is something unimaginable. But it happened. And this is carelessness, right? But 
again, we the parents are permitting this to happen. As a famous uh, American, black American, uh, you could say revolutionary in the time of slavery had said that the limits of the oppressors are set by those who they oppress. A very truthful <coughs> statement. The limits of the oppressors are set by those who they oppress. Meaning, as parents, we set the limits. We tolerate, then they will do. So if we act, we will set those limits. We will cause them to back up and get things in order. If we keep quiet, we just grumble and mumble and then they will continue and it will get worse. So we need to come together as a body. There should be a parents association for the Muslim schools who can assess and look at problems and bring it as one voice to the administration that they must look at, they must address, will not tolerate. But some schools, they told me, one school told me, for example, I spoke to earlier, <coughs> today or was it yesterday, <clears throat> that uh, in their school, they have a clear policy. No Halloween, no Valentines, no birthdays, and you know, but even the non-Muslims are known, they know this is the rule, this is not in place, but the non-Muslim teacher says a parent came with a birthday cake. What am I supposed to do? I don't want to hurt the feelings of the parents, but the school policy is no birthdays. Hey, parents are bringing this stuff. You know. So we have problems. Problems which exist on both sides. But there is a solution. We can correct it. We can learn. But parents as a body have to come together. Concerned parents. But actually, you know what I told this um, principal, when we were discussing this point, I said, you know, they have an IT principle which is called garbage in, garbage out. You know? Garbage in, garbage out. Meaning in your computer, if you put garbage in, you're gonna get garbage coming out of it. You'll print garbage, whatever, you know? If you put in good stuff, good stuff comes out. That's how it works. And the school is the same way. That actually, the effective Muslim schools are those who interview parents before putting the kids in. You know that? They interview the parents. <coughs> so if the parents are not practicing, they say, nah, you know, don't judge me according to how I look, right? I like Islam. I'm not practicing, but I like it. I love Islam. But put my kid in the school. I got the money I can pay. Actually, putting that kid in the school is like a time bomb. Because at home, the family virtually are not Muslims in practice. All the garbage that the kid is receiving in the home, what do you think he's going to do? Bring it right into the school. That's what's going to happen. Some people say, but you, you know, you're preventing these kids from, from getting a chance to, you know, to learn the deen. When you do that, you're preventing those kids. But we say, look, we have a greater body and we have a smaller body. Yes, those kids will be denied the chance to get the education. But that is to protect the bigger body. So the, in reality, this is something Muslim schools have to think about very seriously. When you look at your numbers, fine all the way up to grade six, and then seven and eight they're dropping, why is that? 
because garbage in, garbage out. Most of those kids that are being put in there are garbage. So when the time comes, instead of, because think about it, if those kid parents were seriously concerned about the deen and the raising their children Islamically, why in the world would they take the kids out in junior high? That's just unthinkable. It doesn't make sense. <coughs> but now if the children who are put in from kindergarten, their parents are practicing, then when the time comes for junior high, you think they're going to take their kids out? No way. What's going to happen? The numbers are going to drop. But again, is it about quantity? Well, yes, if school's a business, we have money to make, then it is about quantity. But if the school is about deen, it's ibadah, then it's about quality, not quantity. So this is a, a big thing, a big concept. But truly, the successful schools are those who follow that principle. You interview the parents. If they're not practicing, prepared to reinforce what you're giving the children in the school, then you don't need those kids. You don't need those kids because whatever you teach them, when they go home, the parents are going to cancel it. Zero. You're going to lose. And they're going to bring back the negativity from the home right into the school. That's the bottom line. So for success, we have to think things out here now. Practically, yes, numbers and this thing, but we need, we need commitment to the deen. If we want this to be successful, this can only be truly successful with committed Muslims. We can raise a committed generation, they may be less, but at least we have saved that generation. Oh, we took from... Do you recommend that Muslim families make Ijra to raise their family, their Muslim kids in a Muslim environment, in a Muslim country, and to where? The question of Hijra for saving children, if a person doesn't see any way forward here, they're incapable of benefiting from the other options that are available, and they have the means and the ability to make hijra, then that's what's open to them. You know, it becomes virtually obligatory for them to make that hijra, to protect their children. But the question was, where? <laughs> you know, this was the big question. There are all kinds of issues out there. <laughs> you know. And some of the places that we might think, you know, this is, you go there and poof, you're shocked. Because this thing, this secular, godless thing has been globalized. It's been globalized. It's all over. It's everywhere. So even the hijra option is like, May Allah protect us. What, are, what rights do children have in this parents? What rights do children have from their parents, which are due from their parents? Well, the first right, as I said, is that they need to be raised Islamically. That both of their parents are practicing true Muslims who married for the sake of Allah. And that the environment of their home be an Islamic environment, which is going to help them 
to practice Islam, to understand Islam, to love Islam. And while mentioning that, I should also mention that we have this other problem in our Islamic programs. Whether it is on the weekend, after school, and sometimes even in Islamic schools. That our children hate the Quran classes, the Arabic classes, and Islamic studies. They hate it. They don't like it. You have to drag them bawling and screaming to go to Quran class. Because those people who are teaching these subjects, these most critical subjects, are not trained teachers. They have inherited a legacy of abuse. Those of you who went to Quran schools when you were kids, you know what was happening. You know what you suffered. And this is all over the Muslim world. You know, everybody's laughing because it's everywhere. This is a disease which has permeated our societies. We can laugh about it, but it's really not funny. It's very sad. Very sad. We have to correct it. We have to change our standards to meet what is correct, what is good, what is better. We should not tolerate this kind of abuse any longer. I mean, there was in the newspapers uh, maybe a month or so ago of one case where a kid was beaten to death because he was memorizing the Quran. Little kid about seven years old. I don't know if you guys saw it. It was out, out there in the West. Beaten to death. This is madness. What they teach the non-Muslims or in the non-Muslim systems, education, they, what they teach them, one basic principle for education that they stress to the teachers as they train them, they say to them, make learning fun. Stress it. Make learning fun. When learning is fun, the kids will love it. That's one of their rights. That learning Islam is fun. So they can love it. But if learning Islam is twisting your ear, bending your arm, stand up against the wall on one leg, you know. The chicken, I don't know if you know the chicken, right? You don't know the chicken. The chicken where you, you squat, right? You're not sitting on the ground, right? You put your hands be below your legs and hold your ears. <laughs> it's called the chicken. It's famous. Pakistanis developed it. <laughs> you know? It's torture. It's torture. <laughs> right? So, this is among the rights of the children. That Islam be taught to them in a way which wins their hearts. That they love Islam. Because it's attractive. It was fun. And not something which they were forced. It was beaten on them, forced on them. This is their right. That will give them a chance to live Islam. But the way that we have it going now, no. A'udhu Billah. A'udhu Billah. How many children have suffered? Even memorizing the Quran. Kids memorize the Quran and they hate it after that. Okay, they finished it, but they don't even want to hear the Quran after that. Ya 
Allah guide us. What can a young university age Muslim do to avoid negative influences and temptations in a, in a college environment? <coughs> What can Muslims, young people, do to avoid temptation or the temptations of the college environment? Well, what my advice is, in general, that those people going to college have to be focused. Those kids going into college have to be focused. But again, you know, if we're not talking about conscious Muslim kids, then how do you get them focused? If they're not conscious. So we're talking about people who are conscious. If they're not conscious, then the problem is making them conscious. Because you, no matter what you tell them when they go in there, they're not conscious Islamically, they're finished. The university is the final stroke. What they call the coup de gras. Cut the head off. That's it, finished. I attended a conference after I came here the last time. There's a conference in Toronto. And in this conference, after the conference, I was walking around looking at the books and things outside there. And this sister came up to me. And uh, she had tears in her eyes. She came up and she, she said, Salaam Alaikum. Uh, I said, Salaam. And, um, she said, do you remember I was your student in Dubai? I used to attend your classes. I said, mashallah. I didn't remember. I just said, mashallah. You know, she said, well, remember you, you told me and my husband, you know, we had two young sons. We wanted to go to you. We were asking whether we should go to Canada. You know, we wanted to make hijra to Canada. And you advised us not to go. I, I could start to sort of remember that. I said, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, inshallah. And uh, then she said, um, and we said to you, after you advised us not to go, that we just wanted to go to get the citizenship. So it would be easier for us to move around to different places. We could work in other countries, etc. And you advised us, okay, if you must get this other citizenship, then you go there, get it, as soon as you get it, leave. Don't let your kids grow up in Canada. And we came to Canada. After we got the citizenship, life here felt so comfortable. So many things available, free, you know, health, oh hip, health and housing so nicely made and so many things available in the society, so many opportunities. We just felt so comfortable, we decided to stay on. She said, this year, both of my sons who I brought with me in Dubai, from Dubai. Both of my sons graduated from University of Toronto. Top in their class in physics and biology. Both openly denied the existence of Allah. This is a practicing sister now. Herself and her husband are practicing Muslims. Both of them graduated atheists, denying Allah's existence. Not even doubtful, shaky, but saying there is no God. It's a myth. So, young people going into university have to be clear, focused in terms of what they're going in to study. They have to be clear about what they plan to do when they graduate. How they're going to benefit the Muslim community. We don't have enough teachers 
for our Muslim schools. So most of the Muslim schools have non-Muslim teachers. 50%, 60% non-Muslim <coughs> teachers. This is a failure on our part. Why don't we have enough Muslim teachers? Because priorities have been set in terms of the dunya. Where is most of the money? Engineer, doctor, lawyer. It's about money. But the need of the community, the great need of the community is to have Muslim educators. So it's unfocused. We need to have them focused as they come into this. So they have a goal, they have a clear understanding of the sacrifice they need to do for the sake of Allah. To understand that this study that they're doing in university is ibadah. Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilman sahala Allahu lahu tariqan ila al-jannah. Whoever takes a path in which he or she seeks knowledge, primarily it's knowledge of the deen or knowledge to serve the deen, then Allah will make the path to paradise easy for them. That's what we have to make sure they're going in with that frame of mind. And then of course, that young person in college, they have to be careful about who they take as their friends. Because that's the other thing that's going to come, isn't it? The peer pressure, the friends that you keep. You know, you are who your friends are. You can judge a person by their friends. So very important that they understand that their close friends should be those who remind them of Allah. That is critical. If those close friends are deviated, corrupt, etc., then they will be corrupted. That was the example that the Prophet ﷺ gave of the perfume merchant and the blacksmith. Perfume merchant, you hang around with him, he is going to either give you a little bit of his perfume or at least you go away smelling good from all those bottles that were opened. But the blacksmith, either he's going to be beating that iron, moving the bellows, sparks come out and burn your clothes, or at least you go away stinking of smoke. That's the least. In the West they say, if you lie down with dogs, you will get up with fleas. Yeah. Not as beautiful as the example of the Prophet ﷺ, but it's saying the same thing. So, the environment who you take as your friends are going to determine ultimately how you graduate. Choose your friends well, as the Prophet ﷺ said, you'll be raised on the Day of Judgment with your friends. Um, you basically discussed a very important thing, which is the educational bodies. Um, I think one of, one of the uh, most important things I would like to, to hear your input about it is uh, communication within the families, between the parents and their kids, uh, between the kids, the, the senior and the juniors themselves, how to keep that value of the religion. Especially, uh, you know, the problem is uh, the, the born Muslim families, unfortunately, they don't talk anymore. The, the parents, they don't talk to their kids, and the, the seniors, they don't talk to the juniors, and this is a big problem. So I would like to hear you. Well, uh, actually, our brother's question actually is a comment, and I agree with it 110%, that communication within the family is critical. You know, where parents are not able to communicate with the youth, their, ch their children, their old children, children, they're living in one life or one realm, and the children are somewhere else. There's no communication, <coughs> you know? It's only a command relationship. Do this, don't do this, get out, come in. What are you doing? It's just coarse, rough, tough. The communication is lost. But that's because 
it wasn't begin, it wasn't built from the very beginning. It's not something which just happens. From the early stages, that relationship, that loving, close relationship had to be there. We are like Aqra ibn Habis amongst the Sahaba, who when he saw the Prophet ﷺ kiss Hassan Hussein, young kids, he boasted, I've got 10 kids and I never kissed one of them. You know, that's a man. The man doesn't show that kind of softness. That's like a woman's thing. Prophet ﷺ turned to him and said, what? Man la yarham, la yurham. Whoever doesn't show mercy to Allah's creatures will not receive mercy from Allah subhanahu wa It will be a curse on us. If we don't have that closeness to our children where we have communicated with them as they're growing so they feel they can talk to us. We have explained Islam to them. We have not just commanded them, you are Muslim so do it. We have explained to them, this is something pleasing to Allah, this is something good. Why is it good? Because of so and so and so. We give them according to of course the level that we can explain to them. We get help if we have difficulty. You know? But we have developed those lines of communication from the earliest age. So if we have that, then we have communication when they grow up. But if we haven't, we've just been on the job, providing the money, leaving communication to our wives, then the time comes when we need to communicate and we can't. Because the only time that we got involved was when your wife says, I can't deal with so-and-so anymore, he needs a spanking. You know, so your job is come in and give him a few whacks and you know. He fears you. But where's the love? Missing. You mentioned that 22 year old sister and example of losing Islam and all that. So what is the family supposed to do and what's the solution if they have a youth like that in their family? Okay, what to do if we find our children questioning the beliefs, the fundamental beliefs, questioning Islam. They refuse to practice Islam. What do we do? Do we kick them out? Is that the point where you kick them out? I would say no. They're your children. You have to work. You have to look to see where you went wrong. Try to help them. Let them speak to other people. Maybe people their own age who are practicing. You have developed relationships with other Muslims. Their kids are okay. Have them speak with your kids. Maybe you can't get across to them. Maybe others can. You know? Um, try to find other ways and means, whether it's through the media, whether the good lectures or DVDs, YouTube, whatever, where, which address youth and youth issues, etc., that could reach out to them. You try to find ways and means. Of course, when it reaches the point when they want to come and smoke dope in your house, then you have to put your foot down. You can't say, well, better they smoke dope in the house than out on the street. No. No. Then you're submitting to corruption in your own home on a level which is unacceptable. Because the younger kids, when they see the older, better to remove that older is like the bad apple in the bar barrel. You know, you better to remove to save the others. You have to think about the other members in the family. You know. And, and there's a point where you have to stand. <clears throat> but um, we have to know that in most cases where these kids have reached this state, we are to blame. So where we have found them like this, we have to go and try and find the solution. You know, we can't stand back and say, well, they won't speak to us. We have to bend over backwards. We have to go and find the ways because we have created this situation. Just no, no, hold on. Other people.
you said earlier, the those Muslims who practice rituals are not are called practicing Muslims, but they are not. The real. And at the same time, you also you said yourself, you will be practicing Muslim, practicing Muslim. So what is the real picture of a Muslim practicing Muslim? Well, okay, brother's question basically is what constitutes a truly practicing Muslim, a real practicing Muslim? It is one who externally practices what he internally believes, not one who externally practices something which he internally doesn't believe. That is the, we judge from the outside. Of course, we don't know what is necessarily on people's insides, so we can't go and try to judge what's people's hearts. We don't have that authority. But I'm just saying in terms of reality, reality is that Islam is not only external practice. It's external and internal. So where it is only external, then it is a facade. And this is like the person who the Prophet Sallallahu said in Sahih Muslim who will do the deeds of the people of paradise as it appears to people but he would be from the people of hell. There are people who will do the deeds of the people of paradise as it appears to people. Externally we think this is a practicing Muslim. But because internally it wasn't there they will be from the people of hell. So this is the state, an evil state that inshallah I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us all from. I mean. For, for young people who are already messed up, who recognize that they're messed up, because it's all, you know, if they don't recognize that they're messed up, then there's very little you can do. But if they recognize that they're messed up and they need to, they want to change, they want to do something, then a lot can be done for them, you know. Uh, for, for one, we can bring them back into the fold rather than keeping them at a distance, bring them back into the fold, help them get <laughs> necessary knowledge to improve and to understand what Islam is, get them counseling, people who are qualified counselors, not just, you know, the Imam or the Muaddin. Well, we need qualified counselors, people who are trained, who understand these type of problems and how to resolve them and help them to overcome them. But get them proper counseling to advise them, help them to find uh, jobs, whatever, that they can slot in in a way which is uh, beneficial. We should have uh, different Muslims who have businesses here should have slots for Muslims to work with them. Maybe many people who do have businesses have mostly non-Muslims working for them. You know, we have to consider this. That really if you have a business and you need workers, the people who have the first right to work with you are Muslims. If Allah has blessed you with means, then the first people who you're supposed to help are the Muslims. It's not to say you may not hire non-Muslims, etc. But priority should be given to Muslims. So by having uh, ways and means by which the young people can be reintegrated into the community through work, uh, counseling, education, and youth programs, then they can be brought back 
successfully. But if we don't have these programs, we don't have anything to attract or to hold the youth, even once you got them into the doors of the masjid, what's to keep them there? Then they will eventually just find their way back out again. Inshallah. A lot of Muslim kids say that their Muslim friends or their Muslim friends that go to Islamic school do worse things than their non-Muslim friends. So do they choose non-Muslims over Muslims because of this? Okay, I mean I don't know how true this is, but and the quote from the sister's side is that a lot of the kids say that their Muslim friends are worse than their non-Muslim friends. So in this case, who should they choose as their friends? Well, obviously, we as parents must have failed. If we don't have good Muslim friends around us, then we are the cause of that situation. So the solution lies in us looking at our friendships on what basis we have friendships and changing it to the proper basis, which should be on the basis of Islam and Iman. If we have those kind of friends, then their children will be good Muslims. So our children's friends will be good Muslims. So it goes back to the parents, ultimately. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How do we deal uh, in the situation when we want to educate our children in Muslim school or in, in that country that there might not be any Muslim school between like and what Well I'm not I'm not clear on that question. Talking about the area with Muslim schools are not located. I what do you mean please? Uh, if you're what, in a country No, no just let, let him explain. What what could we, we do for educating our children? Muslim way or Muslim schools when we live in, the, in a country where there is not an elementary Muslim school and in, in a country where some Muslim rights are forbidden like hijab. Then you have to move. If, if, if you want to raise your children Islamically <coughs> and in the area that you are in, whether it is a supposedly Muslim country or whether it is a non-Muslim country, then what you need to do, if you're able, is to move. Move to another area. This is where Hijra is valid for you to shift to another area where you can find a Muslim school where your children can go to Muslim schools. What if you can't move? If you can't move, then you have to consider uh, Homeschooling, teaching your children at home. This is something that Muslims have to take on very seriously, you know, which has been neglected in the Muslim community to a large degree. Okay, brother is stressing the point that the two myths 
that <coughs> are commonly spread about Muslim schools uh, as justification for not putting their children in Muslim schools or removing their children from Muslim schools. The myth that those students who uh, are in the schools, <coughs> the schools that they're studying in are in fact inferior to the existing public schools. Uh, the, our brother who is, I guess, uh, directly involved in, had his own children in the schools and involved in the, the Muslim schools here is saying that this is not the case, that um, they, though they may not be the best, they're still not the worst. Um, that has its own issues, you know. I, I still feel in my mind that, you know, I do agree with those who say they should be the best. There's something wrong why they're not the best. Because we don't have the distractions that the non-Muslims have. They have all kinds of distractions. We don't have those distractions. So really our kids should be the best. Our schools should be the best. So there is, you know, I'm not saying uh, we are the worst, okay, I accept, as you say, but we shouldn't tolerate being just not the worst. We should still say, as parents, it should be the best. But that's not justification, as I said, for taking our kids out of school, you know, or not putting them in the school, because, uh, as I mentioned before, their Iman is most important. Their Iman is more important, in fact, than their academics. But the other point, which was the economics, that these Muslim schools are so expensive, as our brother pointed out, that no child has been turned away from the school here because of economics. They work out something else for you if you don't have enough, you know, honestly, you don't have the means, it's difficult, you got too many kids, it's gonna cost you too much. They will work out some way to get your kids in. So nobody is turned away because of economics. So it is, it is a false uh, myth which has been circulated that Muslim schools are just so expensive we can't afford it. But what in reality is that people tend to put their monies and spend their monies according to their own priorities. So they've chosen other priorities and they're willing to put their money in and put it all in and they've not, they're not willing to spend their money on their children as their children deserve. There's a comment, I guess, from a sister. Um, it says there's something called PAC, Parents Auxiliary Committee. It says every year they, have, they try to give an opportunity for parents to raise their concerns, but no parents show up. The system is there, but no parent wants to utilize it. Okay, as I mentioned that there is a an organization or I guess a, a grouping uh, called PAC, Parents Action, uh, Auxiliary Committee, but that parents are not involved in it. You know, they have an opportunity to utilize it to have some impact or influence on the school, but it's not being utilized. Of course, one has to look in to see why isn't it utilized? Was it because parents did come together and they tried to do something and there was no results? And after trying so many times, they say, well, what's the point? That's what we have to, you know, we have to, we don't just judge it, we have to look to see what was the reason why the parents aren't involved. But I, I, I do know as a general uh, impression in many of the schools that parents don't tend not to be are very much involved in their children's education. You know, I know that, I saw that many places in Toronto where you had some schools where the majority of kids in the schools were Muslims and uh, parents could have made a difference when they have uh, parent-teachers meetings, none of the parents show up. So there's no input from the parents. And once parents are involved, then the teachers become more careful, more concerned, and these kind of things. But when they see that lack of involvement, then the parents feel, 
You know, they, the teachers, sorry, the teachers feel they can do anything. You know, they don't have anybody to check them or to question them, etc. Our question is that, uh, this is our young uh, member of the community. How old are you? Twelve. He questions that if somebody builds a masjid, and Allah builds a house for him in Jannah, but he turned out to be a bad guy, will his house be blown up? <laughs> Well, truly, Allah is just, you know. The house may, be, may have been built, but if he doesn't deserve the house, he's not going to get it. He was a bad guy, he's not going to get it, you know. And also, you have to think, if he was really a bad guy from the first instant, when he built the house, it really wasn't for Allah. The house of Allah, the, when he built the masjid, it really wasn't for Allah. It's so that he could have his name on the door. It says, masjid, so and so. You know, his family. You have masjids like that, where the family name has to be in the name of the masjid. And so you say, what happened to Lillah? For Allah. It's not really for Allah. So he doesn't get the house anyway. Okay. Family members know that that's what he normally would like to recite when he bought him a robe which he hung in his house. Does, does that imply like being a pedar or you have to take the robe or what you have to do with the robe? And especially with the emblems you say, like even though some people get the emblem but still they have the recitation in their heart. So what do you say to that kind of thing? Okay, brother's question concerning um, decorating the walls with Quranic verses. You know, somebody gives you a rug with nice calligraphy of Ayatul Kursi or whatever and hanging it on the wall. You know, basically you're decorating your wall with Quranic verses. Like in the holy mosques in Mecca and Medina. Like the mosques in Mecca, Medina, and many parts of the Muslim world, you know. Um, what do we say about that? Well, it definitely isn't from the Sunnah. It definitely isn't from the Sunnah. And it's preferable not to do so. Because the Master, you have to think, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he got a cloak which was striped, nice colors, whatever, from Yemen, and during his prayer, it caught his attention. At the end of the prayer, he gave it away. He didn't want anything that would distract his attention. So even this practice of all the stuff on the floor here, you know, prayer rugs which are all these designs and you know pictures and you're starting to pray and then the design starts to move on you and you know actually this is not from the sunnah at all if you have a prayer rug it should be just blank but prayer rug nothing on it no kaaba no you know that's the people but and that's why non-muslims think we actually worship the kaaba you know so we have strayed in this matter really you know we've strayed in it to a good degree we've lost the whole concepts of what is concentration in salah about and and um 
we have been overcome by decoration the love of beautification and it's not to say Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty Allah is jameel and yuhibbu al-jawaan it's true but there are limits there are limits Okay, we'll take a uh, last question from somebody who didn't ask a question. It's not a, it's not a question, honestly. It's, it's just a reminder for me and maybe for, for the rest of the uh, Parents should seek sources for halal through his skills and so on. And Allah will help him for that because this is mentioned before the cat, the story of the kids. <laughs> their dad was, was righteous dad and Allah saved their for them. So every parent should seek uh, and earn halal Okay, brother's comment um, <clears throat> as uh, Al Khidr when he spoke about the kids whose father had left wealth buried under the wall that he rebuilt. You know, he re he referred to the parents saying. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُ صَالِحًا أَبُوهُمَا sorry صَالِحًا وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا that their parents were righteous so <coughs> the parent of theirs were righteous, was righteous so that the righteousness of the parent served to protect the children so again stressing the importance of us ourselves being practicing uh, adhering Muslims adhering to the Quran and the Sunnah and being careful about where we earn our money and where we spend it you know that the money we earn if we're earning haram then we are almost cursing our children it's like a curse because our situation becomes cursed our dua is no longer accepted you know, because of the cursed state of the earnings that we, we have. So we have to try to make things as, things as halal as possible. Our environment, our earnings, in all respects, inshallah. With that, we're going to conclude. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu.